Hello, dear friends. I'm back with another very interesting lecture, Novel Stimulation Strategies in Poor Responders in IVFET. This is my personal favorite uh, field, that is infertility. And uh, I really uh, enjoy reading the newer stimulation strategies, newer ideas, newer thoughts, newer innovations in infertility. And today I thought this can help the PGs in uh, writing the recent advance uh, question. This will be definitely there. What are the newer strategies for the poor responders? And there are a lot of things that are there in the uh, domain of poor responders. What is a poor responder? What are the things that can be done? Of course, I take it for granted that you all know already the stimulation protocols. I am going to talk about the newer stimulation protocols. So uh, please concentrate on this topic. I'll go slow. I'll try to explain everything. Uh, then I think you should not have any difficulty in answering the question. This will also help the consultants, especially in the infertility area. So I hope you enjoy this talk as you have been enjoying my talks. Thanks again for the generous compliments, generous uh, appreciations. I'm definitely going to upload all these lectures on YouTube, but I will take my time because there's a lot of uh, um, things have to be done about this. Sometimes I have not recorded, so I'm re-recording for the sake of all of you. And also, I want all the PGs to attend uh, uh, live sessions because if they come to know that it's going to be there anyway on YouTube, they will neither attend the class nor check the YouTube. My intention is that all the postgraduates must, must attend the classes. At least this half an hour or 40 minutes in a day, you will be benefited. But uh, others, please bear with me. I'm going to post them, but I will take some more time. So without wasting much time, because I have to cover a lot of things, I want to go slowly. I want to explain nicely. So. Let's go into the topic, novel stimulation strategies in poor responders in IVFET. So who is a poor responder? Let's go slowly. Women who require large doses of medication to stimulate the ovary. Very easy to understand. But produce less than optimal number of oocytes despite large doses and or or achieve relatively low estradiol levels. Now we are not talking about pregnancy here at all. The pregnancy comes when they respond, when they produce eggs and we retrieve those eggs and fertilize them and transfer them and they get implanted. Before that itself, this happens. So they require large doses and give less than optimal number of oocytes and achieve relatively low stadials, obviously, because if the follicles are less, obviously, estradiol will be less. The rough calculation is per follicle, a mature follicle, you will get around 200. So when you have low estradiol, automatically means low number of oocytes. How do you diagnose? Again, there are different terminologies. Let's understand them slowly. Let's not get confused. Poor ovarian response. Here afterwards, I'll be calling it POR. What is poor ovarian response? Poor response is what we just said earlier. In at least one stimulated cycle, before that, you cannot brand a person as poor responder or a poor response. You should have tried at least one cycle and you should have had this poor response. Now let's go, who is a poor responder? PR. Two stimulated cycles of poor response in the absence of advanced maternal age or abnormal ovarian reserve test. She's young, 
she doesn't have abnormal reservation uh, ovarian reserve test in spite of that two cycles of poor response she has given that is a poor responder now what is this ovarian reserve test i am going to tell you in the next slide but let's first understand the terminologies expected poor responder epr those likely to have a poor response based on their older age and pre cycle abnormal ort now the second one and third one are slightly different in the sense in the second one in the absence of advanced maternal age that is very important or abnormal ovarian reserve test whereas in the third one expected poor responder you expect them to respond poorly based on their older age and pre cycle abnormal ort i am going to tell you what is poor ovarian reserve or as well as poor ovarian response as well as ort don't worry but let us understand this to say that there is poor response at least one cycle poor responder two cycles in a younger age group and in the absence of abnormal ovarian reserve test and expected poor responder is one who is old and he i mean she has pre cycle abnormal ort what is the criteria there are wide variations in specific criteria used clinically and in research studies probably in research studies they are more strict whereas clinically you can't be that strict or it could be vice versa the most followed criteria is bolonas criteria g is silent there it was in isre working group 2011 they declared this and it is still holding at least two of the three must be present something like rotterdam criteria two of the three they say they are i think fond of isre all are fond of telling two out of the three age more than 40 years or any other risk factor for poor response these are all very you know tricky type of uh, wordings so they are not telling everything but you will come to know one after another poor response what is poor response again then they are saying any other risk factor for poor response i am going to show that risk factors in the subsequent slides number 2 three or less oocytes with a conventional protocol in the past so this is the poor response three or less oocytes with a conventional protocol in the past number 3 abnormal ovarian reserve test what is that i promised you to tell you that afc less than 5 to 7 follicles together or amh less than 0.5 to 1.1 nanogram per ml now everything makes sense to you poor response means at least one cycle of poor response in a stimulated cycle that means you achieved less than 3 oocytes and that patient probably had abnormal ort poor responder is one a young patient without having abnormal ort still had less than 3 cycles and expected poor responder is obviously because of her age and abnormal ort we expect her to have poor response i hope now with these two slides everything has made sense to you the only thing that now i need to explain is what are the other risk factors for poor response is it clear to all of you it's at least clear to me so let us move on what are the risk factors for poor response age obviously it's no brainer as the age advances who said it will decrease she will have poor response family history of early menopause so this lady is also likely to have early ovarian insufficiency ovarian damage 
due to endometriosis itself or the surgery for endometriosis, when you do the cystectomy, when you do coagulation, you may actually decrease the number of oocytes inadvertently or the endometriosis itself may damage the ovary. PID, ovarian surgery for any reason, maybe as I said in one of the classes, if it is a dysterminoma, you may remove one of the ovaries. Increased body mass index, that itself is like obesity, PCOS, and definitely there is poor ovarian response. Smoking, smoking is not good at all. You take any disease, you take anything, infertility to the medical disorders, smoking is not good at all. Jokingly, I used to tell the only good thing about smoking is you can reduce weight. How? One lung at a time. I hope you understood the joke. FHR receptor polymorphism and FHR receptor mutations. This is a high risk patient for poor response. Immunologic reasons, autoimmune diseases, we have seen that. Genetic, fragile X syndrome. Iatrogenic, radiation for any reason without covering the ovaries. Chemotherapy, surgery, surgery we have already talked. Idiopathic, of course, idiopathic is always there in, when you don't know the answer, this is a favorite word of all undergraduate students. When they don't know, they say idiopathic. Uh, okay, and that's true as well. Other criteria, so Bolognas criteria is the most important criteria. Then people have got so many criteria, as I told you, over the world, over the, the you know years, there have been many criteria, all over the world, there are different criteria. So this criteria says, Prior cycle with one or more of the following. They didn't say two or two out of three. They say any one or more of the following. Less than four oocytes. So it, Bologna said three or less, but these people are a little generous. As I told you, know, in uh, clinical, they will say they will be a little generous, whereas in research, they'll be a little more strict. So less than four oocytes. FSH, the basal FSH I'm talking about, more than 12 which automatically means less number of oocytes, right? And peak E2, less than 500. What did I tell you? Each follicle, mature follicle will have 200 picograms per ml. So if the peak E2 is less than two, means how many follicles she will have? Two and a half follicles. So this is any one or more, this is another criteria. So remember this number four, okay? So because Next, what I'm going to talk is going to talk with respect to four and above or less. Something like in, uh, as I told you in a partogram, is the four centimeter is the starting point. So four number you remember. And usually 10 is the number that Dr. Pratap sir always tells, you know, when you don't know what to answer, you say just 10%, you'll be correct. All right. So prevalence and prognosis. Prevalence vary between 5.6 to 35.1%. It depends upon which criteria you used. If you used very strict criteria, then of course, you know, it looks like very, very high incidence. But if you used loose criteria, it is just 5.6%. Pregnancy rates also vary. In poor responders, it will be 7.6 to 17.5% is the pregnancy rate, whereas in normal responders, the pregnancy rate shoots up to 259 to 36.7%. As you can see, I have quoted at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven uh, different uh, you know, uh, articles. Low prognosis concept. This Posidon group, patient-oriented strategies encompassing individualized oocyte number. Posidon group is the one which did a very, very good thorough research on this and have come out with fantastic concepts. And this is itself a short note question for you. And you have to understand this very well. The chunk of my today's talk will be on this 2016 and it's still holding. They have given concepts, what is called suboptimal response. Instead of just giving Bologna criteria and all those criteria, they just have they said it's not so, uh, you know, you know, brittle. It is malleable. So you have to again have subcategories of poor response. Suboptimal response is what is the new concept they have brought in. Wherein I remember, I told you, remember number four. They are talking about after four, but less than ten. 
less than four or less than three is a very strict criteria. That's fine. But these people have brought in what's called, we say always between associate professor and professor, you know, if somebody is waiting to become professor, additional professor we bring. So that they have brought in a concept of suboptimal response. Retrieval of four to nine oocytes associated at any given age with a significantly lower live birth rate compared with normal responders who would give you 10 to 15 oocytes. So 10 is the number. We can take it as a uh, you know, difference between normal and suboptimal or rest than that. And in the less than 10, they have categorized a suboptimal group, which is four to nine, because less than four, both Bologna as well as another criteria has told it is poor responder. So they have brought, from poor, they have brought in a category called suboptimal. I hope it's very clear. Then they brought one more criteria called hyper-response, which in here they don't talk about uh, all these things. They say higher dose of chondrotropins and more prolonged stimulation are required to obtain an adequate number of oocytes that is more than three. So here they, if uh, Bologna said uh, it should be less than three to call it poor, then they said, okay, there are more than three, but they required more dose, they required more number of days to get that more than three. They got more than three, better than Bologna's uh, strict criteria, but they required higher dose. So they have named a, it as a different category called hyper-response. So all these things, how they have beautifully combined in their recommendation, I'm going to come up in the subsequent slide after this. The low prognosis concept, this is another concept by the same Posidon group, combines qualitative and quantitative parameters. Qualitative means the quality of the uh, result, mostly in terms of pregnancy, and quantitative in terms of parameters, how many follicles, how much of dose, and how many, uh, you know, all those things. Age of the patient and expected aneuploidy rate, biomarkers, that is AMH, and functional marker, that is AFC. All of us know this, a AMH and AFC, both are A. So they are very important now. Gone are the days when we used to estimate so many things. Now it is simple, A for AMH, A for AFC. This is the slide I was talking about. Let us spend at least five minutes on this slide. This is very important, very easy. Everybody knows about Posidon groups, but then what is my role there? My role is to make it simple, understandable, and understand it for life. There is, you will never forget this, so easy. So they have made, a cross and four quadrants, okay? So always what is left is less, isn't it? So less than 35 years. What is right is more, more than 35 years. And color, see my color choices. Less than 35 is green, more than 35 is red. And anything above is sort of good, isn't it? Adequate ovarian response, again, green color. Anything lower is not good, isn't it? So it is poor or ovarian response. So they have played with this permutation and combination. So first group, obviously they are young, adequate response. Young, less is less than 35 years. There is an adequate ovarian response that is follicles more than five, AMH is more than 1.2 nanograms. And with an unexpected poor or suboptimal ovarian response. In spite of having AFC more than five and AMH more than 1.2, when it comes to the result after ovulation, it is unexpectedly suboptimal. You remember they have brought in a group called suboptimal and hyper-response group. So suboptimal means uh, group A, 1A is less than four oocytes and B is four to nine, okay, after standard ovulation. Ovulation, ovarian stimulation, that's there. Now the second group is more than 35 years, but adequate response. It's also on the above the line, isn't it? So, more, but age-wise more than 35. Here, adequate response is there. That means ovarian reserve more than five, same thing. And AMH is more than 1.2, but again, unexpected results. Two A is more than four, or less than four oocytes, and two B is four to nine. Very clear here. The difference in group one and two is just the age. Whereas, and these two are 
suboptimal, that is four to nine. Of course, uh, one A and two A, they are less than four root sets, but two B and one B are four to nine. That's why they come under suboptimal response group. Now comes group three, Posidon group three. They are below the line, but on the left side of the vertical line. So age is less, but they have a poor ovarian reserve. That is AFC is less than five, AMH is less than 1.2. What did I say? These are expected poor responders. Remember the first slide? Because of their POR. What is POR? Poor ovarian reserve. How do you know that? AF, AFC is more, less than five and AMH is less than 1.2. So these are expected. Now, the last group, as you can see the colors here, green and I'm putting yellow and then amber and then I'm coming to the red group now. That is the older patients and poor ovarian reserve. That's a, not a good combination at all. So these two will become hypo response. They have not responded well. They will not respond well. So if I have to make this totally, this box is green altogether. This box is yellow altogether. This box is sort of amber and this box is red box. So straight away, you know what to expect in these four categories. Isn't it so simple, easy, and beautiful? It is. So what are the benefits of this? It guides to personalize the treatment protocols by using different GNRH analog regimes, detecting polymorphism of gonadotropins their receptors, tailoring the FSS starting dose, and evaluating special regimes, including oocyte embryo accumulation to maximize outcomes. So what is the management of poor responders now, having understood all these things? First of all, you have to identify who is a poor responder and in which class of Posidon or which group they belongs, she belongs, and individualization of controlled ovulation stimulation protocols based on our classification. Best care should be guaranteed in IVF lab. And you have to tailor the embryo transfer. The last two should be common for everybody. We are only dealing with their response, isn't it? So you must ensure best care in IVF lab and you must tailor the embryo transfer. But the first two are the challenge of the topic today. What are the protocols for poor responders? Now the treatment part. Mild stimulation, high dose of gonadotrophins, GnRH agonist, GnRH antagonist, double stimulation, luteal manipulation, alternative approach. Yesterday in the PCO class, I was talking about the different protocols. I told you there are as many protocols as the centers or the infertility specialist in the world. So here itself you can see, and in each one of them, there are many others. But don't get confused. It's all very simple. Mild stimulation, let us take up first. It is almost like natural or a modified natural or a very mild stimulation protocol, as you can, as the name suggests. You don't uh, stimulate them too much because as it is, they are poor responders. All the promising treatment option for younger normal responders, its potential is very limited to poor responders, irrespective of patient stage. So you can venture about mild stimulation only if she's young and if she's not been a poor responder. So if she's a poor responder, this has got no role probably in an in a indirect way of telling that. Its potential is very limited to POR, irrespective of patient's age. So it's out. So let's go to the next regime that's called high dose gonadotrophins. Now, what do you mean by high dose? So fertility sterility, this article is such a wonderful article of comparison of high doses. The starting dose, what we mean is 300. Usually, normally we start with 150 or 225. Here it is 300. Group B is 450 and group C is 600. Very high dose. Thinking that, you know, by giving, and, you know, all these companies tell, our FSH is very good, ours is recombinant, ours is fantastic, poor, I mean, pure and all that. Let's see the comparison. So recombinant FSH dosage, as you can see here, total dosage in this is 2,211, here it is 3,749, here it is 4,575. 
highly significant in the three groups, 0 0.001. But look at the who sets retrieved, nothing great. 566, six. not at all significant. 0.21. Next, let's look at the clinical pregnancy rate. Anything great? 13, 15, 16. Nothing great. Significant, not significant at all. P value 0.95. So, what does this mean to us? It says dose does not result in higher pregnancy rate. No differences between starting dose of 300, 450, 600 of gonadotropin in terms of retrieved oocytes, which you saw in the first slide, number of embryos obtained, and clinical pregnancy rate in the second slide. So, what does that mean? That means it is clear that poor responders have reduced ovarian reserve. Only if you have now. If you have money in the pocket, you can open the pocket and give the money. If you don't have money in the pocket, how can you give? From where can you give? Fewer recruitable follicles. Gondotropin independently of dosage can only support the cohort of follicles receptive to stimulation. If you have, then FSH will help. Without manufacturing follicles, de novo. FSH, however, best, best company in the world, best FSH in the world, highest dosage in the world, cannot manufacture a follicle. If you have the follicle, then yes, we can retrieve it. If you don't have the follicles, because of your age, because of whatever reason, poor ovarian reserve, no FSH is going to help. No amount of FSH is going to help. FSH is going to help. Please understand this. Just by increasing the dosage, you are not going to get good uh, you know, yield. Next, I go to GnRH agonist. Mini dose, 100 microgram per day. You start from previous cycle, mid luteal to menses of this cycle, and then make it half 50 microgram per day till HCG day. Another regime, stop protocol. What do you mean by stop? You started mid luteal you started higher 500 micrograms and as soon as she starts menstruating you stop that that means nothing to be given in the current ivf cycle mid luteal means previous cycle okay this month we are doing ivf we have to think of the previous cycle then there is what is called short or ultra short flare up protocol that means mid luteal of the previous cycle you don't give anything but this cycle from day one to three, you give one milligram per day, and then you make it 250, almost one fourth microgram per day till HCG day. Then there is something called micro dose flare up. What is that? 20 microgram twice a day from day two of this cycle. Blue means this cycle. Green means mid cycle of last year. Menses is menses, red dye color I have written till HCG day. There are so many. Don't worry, don't bother. What's the result? Mini dose, low cancellation and gonadotropins, high peak E2, more oocytes. Stop protocol, higher number of oocytes because you have stopped the GnRH, otherwise, which will down regulate the pituitary, it will decrease the FSH and all those things. That's why when you stop it, once the menses start, that is giving us higher number of oocytes, embryos, and clinical pregnancy rates. Looks better than the mini dosage, right? Short, ultra short protocol. So what does this will do? So this is doing low gonadotropin requirement, obviously, because it is a short and low dosage, as you have seen, higher pregnancy rates. Microdose flare up, fewer cancellations and favorable pregnancy rates. That means it is successfully improving pregnancy rates and less number of FSH and things like that. So each protocol has got its own advantage, as you can, as you saw it. But the disadvantage is higher dose of gonadotropin required, longer protocol, increased OHSS and multiple pregnancy, and all of them together higher cost. Higher cost in terms of more number of FSH required to tackle OHSS higher cost. Multiple pregnancy is also higher cost. So in every which way, GnRH agonist is disadvantageous. So all over the world, it's not very popular now. It's been almost given up. 
So we have the next is GNRH antagonist protocol. So the advantages straight away, if I have to tell you, it avoids suppression during the phase of early follicular recruitment. So what does GNRH agonist do? It will do down regulation of the pituitary. So FSH, LH, both are decreased. Then you have to give from outside so much of FSH and LH. I don't wonder why it was really done. Maybe because antagonists were not well developed or maybe, you know, that time it was uh, like that. Anyway, let me not go into the commercial aspect of it. Thus, maximize the potential endogenous pituitary stimulation. Endogenous. So you are banking on endogenous FSH rather than giving more endogenous, more exogenous FSH. So that is because you are not suppressing the uh, pituitary by giving GNRH analogs in the previous cycle or in this cycle. You harvest the X using the endogenous FSH. Maybe a little bit of exogenous FSH has to be given. And then if the LH is high, you can start antagonist. How do you start antagonist? I'm going to tell in the next cycle. Next slide. So it allows synchronization in growth of the follicles. It prevents unwanted LH surge and hence cancellation. Reduces intensive monitoring of cycles to detect premature LH surge because you are giving antagonists. So there is no question of premature LH surge. So there is no question of everyday testing for LH. And it helps plan the time of home pickup. You know exactly when you have given and all this. So it improves overall pregnancy rates. So what are the regimens? We have what is called fixed regimen, GNRH antagonist, and that is fixed. You give just fifth, fifth day onwards or sixth day onwards, but most of us don't follow that because you, know, you may be giving too early or too late. So we all go for what is called flexible regime. And that is when the follicles are more than 14 millimeters, it is point of no return of the follicles or estradiol is more than 600 micrograms, we are assured of the minimum. Or when the LH is more than 10, you know that it's going to go up. So now is the best time to start antagonist. So this is called flexible protocol. Now I come to what is called double stimulation. It's called Shanghai protocol. It's very interesting. Here it is in the same cycle, you try to harvest as many times as possible. You start with clomiphenicetate, letrozole, give HMG, midway 150 IU, and then you give GNH antagonist, rather agonist as a trigger, retrieve the oocytes, don't leave her alone or don't transfer in that cycle, immediately start HMG 225, again give GNRH analog 0 0.1 milligrams for trigger and retrieve again. So double stimulation. So here, as you can, as I've already explained, First part is clomiphene, letrozole, and you can give actually HMG, right? And then you retrieve the eggs after giving the GNH analog as a trigger. Don't transfer anything in that cycle in the luteal phase. Again, stimulate with HMG, right? Letrozole this time also can be used. And again, one more trigger, again, retrieval. I hope you understood this double. So combination of two stimulations in one cycle, targeted for antral follicles in follicular and luteal phase as well. Usually we talk about the antral follicles of follicular phase. Here, antral follicles are always there. Here you are targeting the antral follicles of the luteal phase also. Reduce the cancellation rates. Two chances of OPU in the same cycle. Once you have done, and again you are doing. Achieve more oocytes and viable embryos in shorter period of time. Because if you keep on waiting, the age, age advances, you will lose the oocytes. That's why they are trying to harvest this. Useful in POR and newly diagnosed cancer patients needing fertility preservation. Again, it's not just the age of suppose having somebody is having cancer, they want to go for chemotherapy or radiotherapy. You want to harvest as many as possible. Again, you can use double stimulation protocol. Then there is a whole lot of luteal manipulation. They gave luteal FSH, E2, and antagonist. But FSH, I'm not going to explain because it results were not encouraging. Don't bother about it. E2 was given. It prevented intercycle rise of FSH. So improves follicular synchronization, coordinates follicular growth, 
more mature oocytes retrieved. So luteal E2 protocol may be of some utility in poor responders, may increase pregnancy rates, improving stimulation, thereby decreasing cancellation. But that's also not very popular. What is popular is luteal antagonist, where it reduces the diameter and side, size disparities. It prevents luteal FSH elevation and early follicular development. So that's exactly right. In CRASH protocol, what do you do? Three milligrams of GNRH antagonist on day 23 of previous cycle. Stimulation in this cycle with recombinant FSH from day two, followed by a flexible, again, GNRH antagonist protocol. So one antagonist in the previous cycle on day 23, FSH in this cycle, and when the criteria meets, flexible protocol, I said more than 14 millimeter follicle, more than 600 picograms of estradiol, or more than 10 uh, LH, you start flexible antagonists. So this works better. Last one is alternate approach, growth hormone, not very good. Recombinant LH does not increase the number or dose of FSH cancellation rates, ongoing pregnancy rates. So recombinant FSH, versus plus recombinant LH versus just recombinant FSH. The meta-analysis showed significantly more oocytes retrieved, significantly higher pregnancy rates, suggesting 30% relative increase in cumulative pregnancy. Long-acting gonotropins are also used, are now available. They are very promising combination of long-acting gonotropin with highly purified HMG in a GNH antagonist regimen can also be used. Androgens, they came but, however, studies were too small and presented clinical and methodological heterogeneity to be conclusive and warrant an immediate change. That's why I didn't really bother to show that. It's not very popular. Aspirins, the results are very poor and controversial, so there is no point in harping more on that. Not to be routinely recommended for women undergoing IVF. Banking of oocytes, yes, it makes sense. Theoretically, this could help to increase the chances of success by endowing patients with a normal responder-like status. That means you keep on retrieving and at the vitrified and vitrified metaphase two, several stimulations, do banking, harvest everything before she becomes old, and then slowly you do fertilization and transfer. So effectiveness of all of them no interventions have been highly effective for improving poor ovarian result response. The most important consideration in poor responders is whether or not to proceed with IVF using a modified approach. So I've given you so many approaches. You can decide which one to use, which one is beneficial to your patient. Thank you very much. I hope you appreciated this talk also. See you tomorrow again with one more talk.